for a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice in the old Republic. Before the dark times. Before the Empire. Go yourself. Hey, Bob. After a disastrous weekend box office where the movie studio came away licking its wounds, we have to ask ourselves, how did this happen? Oh, wait. Did you think I was talking about Dune Part 2? <laughs> Silly me. I was talking about how Denis Villeneuve and Dune Part 2 absolutely destroyed any hope that Disney may have had. Yep, that's right. Dune Part 2 absolutely crucified Disney this weekend with its blockbuster opening. But exactly how did Dune Part 2 do what Disney hasn't been able to do? And where does the film industry go from here? Join me, dear viewer, as I dive back into the world of Dune and its many secrets. As I've mentioned in my last two reviews, Dune has done what Star Wars could never do. Grow up. At this point, it's fair to say that anything that Disney has touched has withered and died. And Star Wars was a major contributing factor to the demise of Disney. In fact, it was the first domino to fall, followed by the MCU and every one of its properties. Let's take a look at the box office numbers, shall we? Disney's 2023 losses are in the billions of dollars. Box office flops like Ant-Man 3, Indiana Jones, and the Dial of Dumbasses, and the Marvels have put Disney on the outs with investors. So when a movie like Dune Part 2 comes around and captures not only the weekend box office, but also the hearts and minds of audiences, I'd say that's a pretty big problem if you're a studio executive at the House of Mouse. And it's now gotten so bad for Disney that they are facing multiple lawsuits from Gina Carano, Elon Musk, as well as a class action lawsuit alleging race and gender discrimination. Yes, that's a real pickle. And not only did Denis Villeneuve adapt the unadaptable book, but he also changed modern Hollywood forever. But exactly how did he do this? And how can other studios such as Disney learn from his successes? There are several reasons for Dune Part 2 dominating the box office. First, the film showed how you can have diverse sets of characters and still tell a good story. What Disney doesn't realize in their blind allegiance to BlackRock's DEI standards is that diversity itself isn't what makes a film good or bad. It simply just is. Talking about race and gender ad nauseum will simply turn people off because no one wants to hear anyone else play victim all the time. What Dune Part 2 did was keep its focus on the story and character development and didn't focus on the race or gender or any other progressive ideology, even though it's all there. By focusing on story and character development, Dune didn't turn off or turn away any viewership or audience like Disney has been doing for the last five years. The second reason for why Dune Part 2 was an astounding achievement in cinema was that they were able to build a cohesive, successful franchise that can last long into the future. Already, Amazon Prime has announced a Bene Gesserit TV series, which has the potential to tell a truly epic political sci-fi story in a way that not even Game of Thrones was ever able to do on HBO. As Dune Part 2 concluded, it set up the third movie in the franchise. They were able to do this while also retaining the fans of the source material while still surprising them. This is something that Disney doesn't have a clue how to do. And yet a third reason for Dune 2's success was that they didn't repeat Disney's biggest mistake, greed. Warner Brothers has undergone a tectonic shift in business strategy over the last few years. David Zaslav slashed everything that was going to bomb and is taking his time trying to rebuild an empire. The Dune franchise is part of that shift in strategy. When Disney acquired Lucasfilm, Marvel, and Fox, it spent way more than it was realistically able to afford. Disney needed to regain their investment as quickly as possible, so they went in hard on producing as much content as they possibly could. That's the key word here. Content. By producing so much throwaway content, they oversaturated the market and quality ultimately suffered. But Warner Brothers is taking an entirely different, more logical approach. Dune Part 1 released back in October of 2021. It's been nearly three years until we got Part 2. 
And now the talk surrounding part three is that we'll be waiting at least another three years for the third one. The point is, Warner Brothers isn't oversaturating the market with throwaway content. They're focusing on taking their time and delivering high quality material. And numbers don't lie. In its opening weekend, Dune Part 2 hauled in $81 million domestically, and globally, it hauled in nearly $200 million. Now, I'm surprised it actually wasn't more, and that's something that worried me when I read about the box office receipts. But it's important to consider timing. March isn't generally a time for releasing major films such as Dune Part 2. If it was me, I would have released it for the summer blockbuster season, and it probably would have earned a lot more in its opening weekend. The film had already been delayed once, so delaying until the summer wasn't really an option. So March it was. But given the fact that word of mouth surrounding this film has reached fever pitch, it stands to reason that the film has staying power. In fact, just today, I overheard random people on the street talking about Dune Messiah, so the film is definitely on everyone's minds. And that's important, because if a film captures audiences in the way that Dune seems to capture it, it really says a lot about its cultural impact. There's also a lot of debates raging as to whether Dune Part 2 is better than Empire Strikes Back. I'd say it's comparing apples to oranges because, as I've mentioned before, the primary difference between Star Wars and Dune was its tone. Star Wars as a franchise appeals to everyone, especially kids, whereas Dune is strongly adult science fiction. Dune is a more mature version of Star Wars. Where I think you can compare Dune and Star Wars is politics, and that comparison is surprisingly made by the prequels. George Lucas's insertion and heavy use of politics in the first trilogy was a good first attempt at more mature themes, but Dune is on another level completely. The reason Dune Part 1 was monumentally important is because it did all the heavy lifting when it came to world building. We got the politics, the government, the religions, the history, and we didn't even get anything about the space guilds yet. The first 300 pages of the book dealt with all of that. The world building of Dune is actually way more complex than that of Star Wars. It's more mature, it's geared for adults, and it's adults that are the primary audience of the Dune franchise. But it's adults that grew up on Star Wars, so it's not really a fair comparison. It's not surprising that Dune succeeded where Disney failed. It succeeded because it grew up, it evolved. Disney got bogged down in DEI initiatives and showing Mary Sue girl bosses and Dune didn't stray its focus from world building, story, and character development. Dune achieved what it achieved not because of diversity and female empowerment, but in spite of it. It showed how cunning and intelligent women can be with its depiction of the Bene Gesserit, and it also showed how vulnerable and tender women can be with its depiction of Chani. It's stuff like that that makes Dune more mature. And it's exactly the reason for why Dune respects its audience, because it treats them like the adults that they already are. But what do you guys think? Do you think Dune box office returns have staying power? And do you agree with the direction Warner Brothers is taking the Dune franchise? Please do let me know down below in the comments. And as always, hit that like button, ring that notification bell, and smash that subscribe button, and I'll see you in the next one.